Hello and welcome to you all. I'm Bill Glaskell at the Volcker Alliance, and this is Special Briefing. Our regular co-host, Susan Wachter of the University of Pennsylvania Institute for Urban Research is away today, and filling in for her is her partner at Penn IUR, Jeannie Birch. Hello, Jeannie. Hello, Bill. Good morning, all. We have a really exciting panel for you today. You bet we do. And I'm going to tell you about it right now. Our focus today is a subject near and dear to your heart, Jeannie, as an urban planner. It's the troubled state and future of mass transportation across the United States and its role in the continued health of cities. From Soho to San Francisco, ridership is still down a third or more since COVID. And a big driver of this, of course, is people still working from home at least a few days a week. And if that weren't enough, billions in federal pandemic aid is set to run out. So the result is that many transit systems are facing fiscal cliffs and will need to come up with new strategies to stay out of the red and avoid crippling service cuts. To explore this big story, let's welcome our great panel. And we have a very, very special guest joining us later in the program, Metropolitan Transportation Authority Chairman and CEO, Jano Lieber. We'll also hear from former U.S. Transportation Secretary Anthony Fox. From Philadelphia, we're joined by Leslie Richards, General Manager and CEO of SEPTA, the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. From Sacramento, please welcome Frank Jimenez of the California Legislative Analyst's Office. And finally, from Boston comes Kurt Forsgren, Managing Director and Transportation Sector Lead at S&P Global Ratings. Welcome to you all. Uh, but just a few reminders before we get going. We're coming to you live on the Volcker Alliance and Penn IUR websites, and also on this special briefing podcast. As always, we've taken your questions in advance, and we'll get to them in the second half. And of course, special briefing is made possible with the generous support of the Volcker Alliance, members of the Penn IUR Board of Advisors, and the Century Foundation. Our thanks to you all. But now, before we dig into mass transit, Let's take a moment to remember our late dear friend and colleague, Dick Ravitch. Dick would have wanted to be here on our virtual stage today. He was a main actor in the rescue of New York City from near bankruptcy back in 1975. And as a reward, Governor Hugh Carey named him chairman of the MTA, where he rebuilt the city's decrepit subway network. He later served as New York State's lieutenant governor, but right up to his tragic death in June at the age of 89. Dick remained proprietary about the MTA and his subway. Dick's back-to-back -back rescues of New York City and the MTA gave him a foundation for almost four decades of work to promote the idea of sustainable finances among states, cities, and agencies across the country. It's not an exaggeration to say that he'll be missed tremendously by those of us who knew him well, including Jeannie and, and Susan Walker, right, Jeannie? Absolutely. He was us. Giant in the field. You bet. And and all, he'll also be missed by the countless Americans who benefited from his generous philanthropy, selfless public service, and unparalleled wisdom. Dick's knowledge and enthusiasm for public service certainly enriched special briefing during his many appearances over the past three years. And in many ways, he's still with us today. So now let's get to work. To kick things off, we're going to turn to Anthony Fox, who served with Dick on the Volcker Alliance board. Secretary Fox comes to us on tape, and following his remarks, we'll return to the live panel discussion. And now it's our honor to welcome Secretary Anthony Fox. It's my pleasure. The leader of mass transportation as the U.S. pandemic aid nears an end. I am privileged to be part of this conversation at the most urgent of transit in America. Prior to the COVID uh, pandemic, our transit agencies were near record highs in ridership and in revenue. And following COVID, we've obviously seen quite a drop off in ridership, in revenue. And now with the end of our COVID relief packages, we're seeing a cliff in front of us that can devastate transit agencies all across the country. This conversation, therefore, is timely. As we think about how to shape the future of transit in light of the crisis we are emerging from, I think it is important for us to think 
about different solutions for a different age. For example, I was pleased to see the federal government step in and provide operating support for transit agencies as a result of COVID to continue these transit systems and to allow them to enable the best future for the people who depend on our transit systems. We will need to continue engaging at the federal level to find ways to ge generate operating support for transit agencies. While perhaps not as generous as the COVID relief package, uh, I think given the circumstances, any relief would be absolutely helpful. Agencies are also gonna be looking at new revenue sources at the state and local level, whether that is in the form of sales taxes or as New York has done with uh, congestion pricing uh, or California. Uh, I think we're gonna have to look at new ways to generate income from uh, local and state sources to support our, our transit systems as well. We will obviously also have to look at service levels. And my hope is that transit agencies will be creative in finding ways to, uh, to, to, to move towards a more on-demand transit future. I think those types of innovations, mimicking a bit of what the private sector is doing, can help us meet the demand where it is, which is more door-to-door -to -door today than it's been in the past. And finally, uh, we have to continue also thinking about the future. Even though we are in a point in time where the operating support levels have dropped because fewer people are using transit today than before the pandemic, we have to operate with the presumption that as population growth does continue, as communities continue to struggle with traffic and other uh, problems that plague our urban centers, uh, we're going to continue to need our transit systems to be strong and vibrant. And so I hope that we don't lose sight of the need to continue building the transit needs of tomorrow, today, on the capital side, even as we're struggling to figure out how to make a, the operating support of our transit systems continue. So with that, I will, uh, I will end. I'm sorry I'm not with you. I'm traveling this week, but I, I know this conversation will be incredibly impactful to not only the people who are attending, but to those millions of people in America who depend on our transit systems every single day. Thank you. Well, thank you, Secretary Fox, uh, for those those great comments that frames our discussion terrifically today. Uh, Jeannie Birch, I know you have uh, you have a, a quick question to ask, and I may have a follow up one as well. So, Jeannie. Uh, thank you, Secretary Fox. I have a very simple question, and that is, why don't Americans like mass transit? <laughs> Why don't Americans like mass transit? You know, I, I think um, to some extent, we got fascinated with automobiles back in the 1950s and, and beyond. And the idea that, uh, that I can take my car and go wherever I want to uh, has, a, has a certain kind of appeal to many Americans. At the same time, as everyone is, is trying to make their own way, we're, we're finding that that also creates problems. We have problems with traffic that, uh, that are uh, much more um, impactful today than they've been at any point in time. We're seeing uh, record high pedestrian fatalities in this country, um, which is also partly due to um, individual drivers. Um, and we're also seeing in, in this country, I think, uh, uh, a desire for solutions that integrate technology, um, that, uh, that give us um, alternatives to, to getting in, in, a, in a car. And I think this younger generation is, is much less interested in, in driving today than previous generations. So there's a, there's sort of a mix of uh, pushes and pulls that I think make it, make it uh, attractive for people to avoid transit uh, but I think those are starting to recede, and I think people are starting to rethink um, using transit as a way of getting to, to and from places. Uh, I would also say that there is a cultural underpinning of this too, which is um, we sometimes un, un, unfortunately associate transit with um, lower socioeconomic status. And I think we have to acknowledge that perception, even though I think the data 
shows that uh, that many people who uh, uh, who have options and, and who have financial means to to travel otherwise actually do use mass transit, and particularly in places like New York City, your your hometown, and and Chicago, and and uh, Los Angeles, and some of our larger transit systems see a very high percentage of high income people using transit. Um, so I, I think that perception uh, has to change, and we we you know we have to present people with the real data, which which suggests you know I for example I was looking at some statistics from after the other day that uh, uh, that suggests that uh, a, a very significant uh, portion of the ridership in our nation's transit systems uh, are are white, uh, not. Uh, high, in high, as high a minority as people think. Uh, they're higher income than people think. Um, they're a uh, higher percentage of people uh, who are employed than people may think. So I think we've got we've to get over the idea that our transit systems are for those people. It's for all of us. And, and because it's there for all of us, and if we all, all of us use it, it's better for the environment, it's better for our economy, uh, it's better for um, a livability of our cities, and it's frankly a lot of times better for our health because we we use steps to get to our transit system that we don't use when we hop in our cars. Thank I've just you. got one quick follow up question in the minute or so we have left. You mentioned on demand transit. I'm a, I'm a lifelong subway subway bus train rider uh, ever since I've been a kid in New York City. Um, that's not on demand transit. So so. We're, we're, we're just sketch that out for us. Uh, sure. How, yeah. how this fits into the matrix. Well, you know, we have some uh, models of this uh, on demand system today uh, with, with paratransit, for example, and some rides that seniors use. Um, the, the idea that a transit trip can actually be a door to door trip is a pretty radical idea. Um, but we have the technology today, you know, back in the day, uh, you had fixed routes partly because uh, that was the most efficient and the most uh, the, the the most e the easiest way for transit planners to actually design routes. But today we have the capability of using uh, algorithms to help us identify who needs a ride at any given time, and a route doesn't have to be as fixed today as as it used to be. So I would like to see transit agencies starting to. Um, experiment more with this and of course there are private sector uh, firms out there that could be partners with our transit systems and um and, and i think in a mutually beneficial way so I, I think um in addition to trying to figure out the the operating challenges um i would be thinking about the the problem we face as you know finding the customer where the customer is and if the customer has a choice of of a door-to-door -door service that may be private or, or uh, a sort of wholesale approach, which is public, um, we're going to lose some of those people, and we want to get those people back on transit. So I, I would strongly urge us to be creative as we're thinking about how to solve the problem we're, we're, we're confronting. Darn right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Secretary Fox. Uh, you've posed some really interesting questions that we'll take up with our panel later in the, in the program, uh, and we'll be talking to you later. Thank you. And now we're back live. And again, thank you. Uh, thank you, Secretary Fox. And thank you, Jeannie, for the for the questions. And Jeannie, uh, I'm going to reintroduce you again, my friend and colleague, Jeannie Birch from Penn IUR. You're going to introduce our next guest, Leslie Richards. So Jeannie, it's all yours. So since 2020, Leslie Richards has been the general manager of SEPTA, the fifth largest transit system in the United States, with a budget of about $1.8 billion, highly dependent on government. Prior to that, she was the Secretary of Transportation of the state of Pennsylvania. And even prior to that, she received degrees from the University of Pennsylvania in city planning and has recently returned to uh, Penn as a professor of practice. She's engaging in some very exciting work as she deals with the falling revenues that actually occurred well before COVID struck us, but have been accentuated by the COVID work for home phenomenon. Leslie, welcome. Thank you, Jeannie. Whoops. Let's see if we can do this. Good to see you. 
Can everyone hear me okay? I was also having a little IT issues. So I have a backup next to me. If you need me, just let me know. I, I'll I'm clear. But happy to share with you uh, what's happening uh, at SEPTA here for a few minutes. Um, as everyone knows and has already been uh, discussed, um, public transit obviously has been profoundly impacted by the pandemic. Um, we face a number of challenges now and in the future. It's already been mentioned, a few of them, teleworking, change commuting patterns, budget shortfalls, workforce retention and development, safety, as well as perceptions of safety in many of our cities uh, who rely on transit. And what is, what is clear is that the post-COVID era's critical role that transit plays is, is not going to change. But we have to rethink about how we do things and how we make decisions. We know that cities and regions and transit are intrinsically related. We know that our futures are tied together, that the stronger our transit system is, uh, the stronger the region that it operates uh, is, is uh, bouncing back as well. Um, as mentioned by Secretary Fox, we wanna reduce the carbon footprint together. We wanna help our economy, our environment. We wanna help equitable futures. Uh, we wanna help our cities be as livable as possible. So um, these things obviously are, are really, really important. Uh, as Jeannie mentioned, I've been at SEPTA for a very challenging three and a half years. I started in January of 2020. Um, I'm thrilled that I just signed another contract for another four years. And I just wanna be clear that I would not have done so if I wasn't optimistic about the future of transit here in the Philadelphia region and nationally. And especially with the team members that we have here and others who are working to figure this uh, challenge out. Uh, so we talked about the fiscal cliff a, a little bit, and I just wanted to mention uh, what does Cef SEPTA's fiscal cliff look like? Of course, each large transit agency is um, facing uh, slightly different challenges, um, but we're, we are all having operating fund shortfalls. So with SEPTA, um, our COVID relief uh, money was really what helped keep us going. And in April of this coming year, 2024, all of that federal relief money runs out. That's where our cliff starts. Um, we will see uh, over $50 million in shortfalls to get us to the end of our fiscal year, which would be June 30th of 2024. And then um, after that, we're facing anywhere from 240 to $270 million a year. The good news is just this past month, we had our highest rate of recovery um, on, our, on our ridership. Um, we're just over 60%, we're at around 62%. I believe the national average is around 74%. So we're a little behind that national average, but that makes a lot of sense since we have six different modes here at SEPTA and, uh, and each mode is coming back um, at, at a different percentage. We're working very hard um, uh, on funding opportunities with our state government, with our local government. We're looking to see how we can get matches. Um, on the capital side, we're looking to see how we can take advantage of all the competitive grants in the, in the uh, federal bill right now. And we know that we're not alone. Uh, we are also looking into a variety of cost-saving me measures here. And so, um, we are looking at our bus network uh, and how we can redo that network and make it more efficient. Our bus network has not had a comprehensive redesign in over 60 years, um, but change is not easy to, to transit uh, riders, definitely not in uh, the Philadelphia region. So uh, we are working on that. We're doing a new wayfinding master plan and we looked at London and Paris, we looked at New York and we're looking at how they use letters and numbers and shapes and colors and how it can be easier uh, to navigate this 100-year-old system for us. And also how we can use the different modes. For the first time, we have transfers uh, to here, uh, our board voted on, as well as looking how we can get our transit riders using regional rail and making that easy. And for the first time, weekly and monthly passes can be used on all of those modes together. I wanna highlight um, three programs that we're working on uh, very quickly. Uh, and one is our scope program. Uh, we're having uh, large challenges uh, with our unhoused populations, as well as those 
um, experiencing mental health uh, challenges and drug addiction uh, on our system. I'm very proud of how we've partnered with uh, the five counties we work in with their social services, getting addiction specialists, getting people to the services that they need uh, to support them and get them um, in, in, in a better place. Uh, and we're, we're very excited about that. Uh, we also have an efficiency and accountability initiative that we started that is completely employee-led, employee ideas of how we can be more efficient, save money, do things um, uh, more effectively, obviously saving money and time, which we need. We've already figured out over $38 million of annual savings. And this year we plan to get to that number of 100 million. And then the last project I wanna mention before moving on, and that would be our Septic Key Advantage program where we're working with employers, offering them a heavily discounted rate uh, to ride our system. And they are now offering employees free transit benefits. They get to ride SEPTA for free as part of their employee benefit. It has been highly successful. We have over 60,000 um, employees now riding SEPTA for free. We're looking to expand that. Everyone who's done our pilot program wants to expand it as well. We recently had an I-95 collapse here um, and SEPTA was really able to rise to the occasion, um, but we need to solve our fiscal cliff so we can continue to do that. I think it highlighted uh, what was going on and I'm sure SEPTA will show the whole world when we host the FIFA, um, some of the games in, in 2026 coming up as well as the 250th anniversary, obviously Philadelphia being a very important part there. So we look forward to the discussion and uh, thanks for having us here. Thanks, Leslie. And the innovations are very, very exciting, particularly the uh, employee uh, uh, program that we've engaged. And I know the University of Pennsylvania uh, involved in that and we wish you yes. well with that. Uh, thank you. Uh, you'll be, we'll be back to you with lots of questions. And so let's now turn to Frank Jimenez. Frank is a senior fiscal and policy analyst at the Cal nonpartisan California Legislative Analyst Office, where he's in charge of uh, uh, transportation and general highway roads of California Transportation Commission, California Department of Transportation. And he's been there three years observing what's been happening at, uh, in California. Frank, come tell us a little bit about that. Thank you, Jeannie. Hello, everyone. Um, again, my name is Frank Jimenez, and I'm a senior fiscal policy analyst at the Legislative Analyst Office here in Sacramento, California, where I cover issues related to state transportation funding. As Jeannie mentioned, LAO is a nonpartisan office within the state legislature that provides budget and policy advice. Um, in my remarks today, I'll be talking about the state of transit in California, um, the budget actions that the state took to provide relief to transit agencies, and what the state will be looking forward to in the future. Um, so coming into the state of transit, um, transit ridership in California had been on a gradual decline since 2014. However, ridership dropped dramatically when the pandemic began in 2020, falling by more than 50% when compared to the previous year. Through various um, federal relief packages, um, transit agencies across the state received a total of $9.8 billion. And many of these agencies have been utilizing federal relief funding to sustain their operations. However, going into the budget year, some individual transit agencies across the state projected ongoing operational sh funding shortfalls as they began to exhaust federal relief funding and as ridership um, remained below pre-pandemic levels. Currently, the state is around 67% of pre-pandemic ridership when comparing May 2023 to May 2019. Um, the California Transit Association, which represents a significant portion of the state transit of the transit agencies in our state, estimated that the statewide operational funding shortfall or need statewide was around six billion dollars over a five year period. Um, operational funding shortfalls were estimated across many transit agencies that serve major population centers across the state. However, this issue was more acute in the Bay Area, given that these that the agencies that serve this area generally are more reliant on fares to support their operations and have seen significant changes in commuting patterns in the regions that they serve. Um, in its budget discussions, the legislature was interested in providing short-term relief to transit agencies to reduce the impacts related to service cuts and fare increases and to provide um, agencies additional time to find long-term solutions to address their operational funding shortfalls. 
However, the legislature in its discussions also wanted to ensure that any relief funding provided included appropriate accountability measures. So ultimately in the budget, um, in the final budget package, the legislature provided um, 5.1 billion in formula funding to support transit agencies um, across the state over a four year period. Um, this funding is on top of the state's baseline funding that supports transit agencies, which is mostly funded from fuel taxes and vehicle fees. Um, this augmentation included 4 billion in capital funding from the general fund that had been previously agreed to in prior budgets. However, the legislature provided agencies the flexibility to use this money on capital or operations previously it had just been um, set aside for capital expenses. The legislature is able to maintain this funding despite a $32 billion budget deficit by making cuts in other areas of the budget that had received you know, significant one-time general fund augmentations from previous general fund surpluses. The legislature also provided uh, $1.1 billion, mostly by redirecting funding from our state's cap and trade program, the revenues that are generated um, through that mechanism, to new formula program that allows agencies to use funding on zero emission transit vehicles or operations. Um, the funding also included accountability measures. Agencies are required to submit short-term plans that provide the state information on how they'll be using funding. And also with the long-term plans, agencies will be required to provide five-year estimates of their operational needs. Um, and finally, to, um, with this package, the state, the legislature also required our Secretary of Transportation to create a transit task force made up of representatives from state agencies um, transit agencies, local governments, um, community-based organizations, and academia. Um, the Secretary of Transportation, in consultation with this task force, is required to submit a report to the legislature by October 2025 that includes policy recommendations to grow transit ridership and improve transit overall. So looking forward into the future, over the near term, the legislature will be looking at how agencies are utilizing relief funding, seeing to what extent transit ridership is returning monitoring how agencies are developing and implement, implementing strategies that lead towards long-term financial sustainability. And over the long run, the legislature will be discussing um, policy and funding changes that could improve transit. And this is um, along with um, the help with the, the ultimate recommendations from the Transit Task Force. So happy to take any questions. Well, thank you so much, Frank. Um, and we will get to some of these questions uh, later. This is just a quick reminder that you're tuned into special briefing from the Volcker Alliance and Penn IUR. The archived editions of this and all past special briefings can be found on our websites or on the special briefing podcast. And now let's welcome S&P transportation guru, Kurt Forsgren. Uh, and I see that General Lieber has, uh, has logged into the, uh, to the call as well. So we'll follow with Mr. Lieber right after. So, Kurt, is 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 mass transit at a critical inflection point? Uh, it, everybody seems to seems to be implying that. Yeah, thanks, Bill. It, it's I would say inflection point is is a probably great description. Uh, I've heard existential threat, uh, so that's probably improvement from that uh, description. But and of course, here at S and P, we're not in the business of outlining policy alternatives. Or our perspectives are really focused more on the very night and narrow and focus of full and timely payment. So um, what I'd like to do is just sort of share kind of our current views of the sector and how we see things affecting credit going forward. Um, so during the pandemic, we would watch um, almost daily the TSA uh, checkpoint screening information as we monitored our universe of airport credits. And so for transit, we're continuing to watch the weekly American Public Transit Association data, which for the past, I think now 187 weeks, um, really provides a great visual of the slow ridership recovery that we've seen nationally. I think Leslie mentioned is about 74%. Uh, so a year ago, it was about 59%. So we're definitely seeing an improving trend here. And I think um, there are other data sources though that suggest this may be kind of the new normal. Um, um, Stanford University has a monthly study that they do looking at uh, work from home trends. And so they report about 12% of workers are fully remote, remote these days. 60% um, are coming to work in person every day and about 28% are hybrid. We also look at the Castle 10 city uh, average off office occupancy data. Um, they look at security badge swipes at about 138 cities across the US. 
And I think last week it was about 50%. So uh, again, that's an improvement from 43% of last year, but that's a lot of transit trips that aren't really happening. So, um, so you may be asking, what are we seeing across our universe of, of rated credits? We have about 35, 36 or so transit agencies um, and a lot more ratings based on different security types. But those ratings are, are relatively strong. We, they're in the A category or double A category, which is very strong. Um, so about a year ago, we had some research published, um, uh, which I think you have available on your website, that really looked at uh, the, these transit agencies in depth, um, what their riding, ridership challenges look like, and, the, and in fact, um, highlighted those funding you know, issues that we're talking about today. We didn't really see much improvement in that uh, in the past this months after we wrote the article. And so in January of this year, we changed our sector view to, to negative. And so this is really based on two main factors. One, because we talked about the stubbornly slow ridership and fair performance that we don't really see changing in the foreseeable future. I mean, it will be improving, but it won't certainly get back to 2019 levels. And then, as we, as we also talked about, the structural operating fund deficit that many agencies will be facing when their federal assistance runs out. This latter issue is particularly important for those agencies that are dependent on fair revenues. And our definition is that there's about 25% of revenues uh, from fair revenues is kind of the, the kind of the point where we see a lot of stress. But even for those transit agencies where they have sales taxes or other forms of tax support that make up a bulk of revenues. We felt that the ridership loss is likely to impact their operating funds and have ripple effects across their enterprise. So from a credit perspective, it, it was really hard. It's really hard to understate how important the almost $72 billion in federal support has been. I mean, it runs out, as we've heard, 2024, 2025. And, and while operators have scaled back their operations somewhat, for the most part, fixed costs have not come down, certainly commensurate with the reduction in fair revenues. And, and for a variety of reasons, you know, including receipt of federal assistance, the significant expense and service reductions really have not come yet and are not likely to come unless transit agencies have really no other options. So longer term, we believe the key question is whether mass transit, transit agencies will be able to achieve an operating fund balance once this federal aid is depleted, assuming the ridership levels do not really recover. And this may require then, as we heard Mr. Fox speak to, uh, we require them to rethink how service, look, uh, what service looks like, new sources of revenue and, and new sources of political support. As you mentioned, we've seen some positive actions in the states of uh, New York and California and Minnesota, uh, providing additional tax support or one-time subsidies, at least to get them over the hump. Um, and other states are looking at similar, taking similar measures. So, so as of right now, we kind of see a tale of two transit operator types. One is those who benefit from significant tax revenues, which be able to fund their operations. Um, and those have exhibited credit stability through the pandemic, and we expect that to continue. On the other side, we have those that really need access to sustainable revenues from what, what they can't really control autonomously. They can't really raise fares practically or politically, uh, and they don't have other sources currently at their disposal. So those are the ones that have the most challenges going forward, as you might expect. Uh, and we'll be watching what happens over the next several months and into the next year. Well, thanks so much, Kurt. And now our, our very special guest and last panelist, uh, the chairman and CEO of the nation's biggest mass transit system, along with nine bridges and tunnels uh, from New York City. Please welcome Jano Lieber. Good to, good to meet you, Mr. Lieber. I know you and Dick uh, talk frequently. Um, and by the way, I, I love the new Omni system. Tap your, uh, tap your cell phone and, uh, and get on the train. It's terrific. Uh, so, you know, tell us about Dick's legacy and about the path forward for the for the MTA. And God knows we have plenty of questions. First, I'm Jano. I'm like uh, I'm a little like uh, Beyonce or Madonna. I'm a, I'm a one name person. So, everybody, yeah. um, but um, first of all, I got to say thank you. Whenever there's a rider who uh, uh, expresses satisfaction with MTA service, we say thank you, and uh, we'll uh, we'll hope to keep you. Keep you, keep you happy. Listen, um, you know, the, I was honored to be asked to, to speak at this uh, this event, be, partly because you know, Dick Ravitch is sort of represents everything that I think everybody on this call and so many other folks are interested in, which is how do we 
how do we meet the challenges of the moment uh, for mass transit and, and make sure we have first class mass transit because it's essential to having dynamic, high functioning, and you know, uh, climate change ready uh, urban areas. And if, if you believe, like those of us in New York, that you know, cities are where our economy and creativity and a lot of our cultural dynamism is coming from. Uh, then mass transit is definitely where it's at. It's an essential ingredient. Because as I always say, you know, New York, for, for New Yorkers, that we are 40 plus percent of the ridership nationally on mass transit. For New Yorkers, mass transit is like air and water. We couldn't exist without it. With our density, um, we literally could function uh, uh, but for the mass transit system. Nick Ravage, uh, by coincidence, I knew him Going back to when I was in high school, uh, his first wife, Diane, was an educational activist. My mother was in that world a little bit. And I, I, I got to know him socially a tiny bit. And then later on, uh, I, I was inspired to get into the transit business because it was the area in the dark days, the late 70s and the early 80s, where there, were, there was real uh, progress. And a lot of that was because of Dick, because of his willingness to try to attack the problems of a, a system that was declining, both in terms of operation and its physical characteristics, and also the sense of safety or lack of it. And Dick, uh, and Dick you know, was, was a straight talker. He, he told the truth to the world about it. And most important, he educated decision makers, especially those who controlled the purse strings, and built um, through his, you know, his command of, of press, a, a, a consensus among New Yorkers. We had to do something. And that was the beginning of the revival of the MTA that went, brought us from, you know, the, uh, the graffiti scar, dangerous uh, uh, archetype that you still see carried sometimes on Saturday Night Live time to time to, you know, super high functioning system that had many, many more riders than, than, than ever before, uh, before COVID. So, and then Dick obviously did a lot of other things in his life, among them becoming the lieutenant governor of the state of New York. But when we faced our fiscal cliff, and I started because, you know, obviously we were looking at the reality of the fiscal cliff very early, um, even as we were campaigning for the feds to include transit in a meaningful way in the COVID relief packages, we saw that the, the money would only go a couple of years because of the scale of the problem and, and, and the ridership fall off with the cost implications. And I spent a lot of time with Dick and Dick actually became one of my secret weapons in trying to persuade the governor and the legislature and the public and the chattering classes that it was time to admit to, to solve the MTA fiscal cliff now rather than waiting until the money ran out. And so he actually wrote a couple of op-eds and I enlisted him in a couple of other settings and he made a difference. So um, right to the end, uh, Dick was passionate about mass transit, passionate about truth telling, passionate about budget, being budget responsible and forward thinking. And he made a difference literally uh, to his dying day. So I'm, I, I'm honored to, but uh, in his memory to talk about where we are and, and how we got here. All the challenges that Leslie Richards talked about applied in New York, ridership, the challenges of service and hiring, the safety issues and the, the way that the public space has been impacted by the, you know, the, the reality of mental health and, and to some extent, it's mostly mental health issues, but also drug addiction playing out in public spaces and the impact that has on the way people use and feel comfortable in public space or not. We have all those same issues. But from a, from a, a, a funding standpoint, um, we, had, we got roughly $15 billion out of the three COVID relief packages. We saw that that money was gonna run out in 2024 and starting about over a year ago, our team began putting together a plan for how we would ask the governor, the governor's leadership, and the legislature to address that problem and not wait until we were looking over the precipice of the cliff. And I made the case, and, and Dick and others helped me, that it was insane for New York, where we have 85% you know, of our commuters use mass transit, five or six percent walk or use city bike, you know, less than roughly 10% drive, which is a rich man's game given the parking costs in the central business state. 
and it is and, and the number is even higher among our uh, the working class low income New Yorkers. So it's it's an intense equity issue. Um, and and we, we made the case, I think, you know, somewhat effectively, that it was an issue that we it made no sense to wait until you were faced with the choice of massively cutting service or massively rating right, we're, we're using fair, we're doing layoffs that made, made no sense, and that the legislature should get ahead of it. The governor made a proposal um, that combined uh, you know, significant MTA uh, MTA uh, cost efficiencies for it's now five hundred million dollars per year. We figured out most of that, and we're in the process of implementing it. We have an eighteen billion dollar budget, so um, that's you know that's a, a significant number, but not unreasonable. Um, additional revenues they helped us close a gap of about two billion dollars with about a billion or a billion two additional revenues, and at the back end of those additional payroll tax revenues. The governor also committed um, a share of what looks to be uh, the, the first uh, three casinos that are going to be in the city of New York. New York City has never had uh, full operation casinos. There's obviously a lot of licensing and operational fees to be had there, and that provides us security at the back end. The result is that we have just last week unveiled our financial plan. It's a mid-year uh, update where we're showing five zeros, five years of no deficits because of what the governor, under the governor's leadership, we were able to come back, uh, we were able to accomplish with, with legislative support. So, you know, I, I, I'm very proud of that. I think it sort of speaks to the way that New York does prioritize mass transit. Um, there's a lot of politics, I'll spare you that, but uh, we're in, I think, optimistic. Now, our ridership, you know, the height of COVID, our ridership was down to 10%. Notwithstanding, we ran very heavy service, unlike some other places, because for the essential workers, whether they're hospital workers or pharmacy workers or grocery store workers or people who drive, drove the Amazon trucks, they had to get there by mass transit. And that's just New York. So we kept running service, even though we were at 10% and losing roughly $200 million a week at the height of the pandemic. And I think that, that the fact that that was so important to New York's ability to muscle through the pandemic and the heroism of our workforce in showing up every day, and, and there were 150 folks who lost their lives you know, among the MTA's 70,000 employees, um, uh, I think gave the public a sense of, you know, uh, there was a, we're all in this together feeling that panned out in the end. We also have wrestled through uh, the, the safety challenges of that post-COVID environment and mental health uh, issues in the public space. The governor and the mayor teamed up to do what we, they call the COPS Cameras and Care Initiative. And our first six months of 2023 are the safest six months from a subway crime standpoint on record since they began keeping close tabs on subway crimes in the uh, early 1990s. So we have a, you know, it's not, we still have high profile crimes from time to time that capture the public's imagination with the assistance of the Murdoch press. But, uh, um, but, but we're, but broadly speaking, we have, um, we moved the dial on customer perceptions of safety dramatically. And the net net is um, we are running with our paying ridership is roughly 70% of pre-COVID. Uh, and it's interestingly as much on the commuter railroads as on the subway, but because there has been a significant uptick in fare evasion, the true apples to apples with pre-COVID is really closer to 80%. So I think we have done reasonably well in recapturing our ridership. And I always say, I am not, you know, I'm not terrified of uh, hybrid work. If you're a, an ambitious young person tapping away in your apartment two plus days a week. You want New York more than ever. You want to walk out the door and have parks and restaurants and nightlife and social opportunities, whether Tinder assisted or not, um, and be able to, uh, uh, I think people are ambitious young people are going to still come flock to New York and the companies will follow them. So. We just need a funding model that supports a, a very 
a robust level of service, and we're doing that. We have actually added service as a result of that Albany budget deal rather than cutting service. And so I think we have been reasonably successful. There's a ton of other positive stuff to discuss. Um, but, you know, uh, service is the best in 10 years in terms of on-time performance. Uh, our commuter railroads, as well as our, our, our subway and bus network, we're redesigning the bus network for the first time in 100 years to give people better service and more service and faster service. And uh, I think we've re and, and the interesting thing, and I'll finish with this, is that obviously Mondays and Fridays with the new hybrid work environment are down relative to the middle of the week. But the weekends and nights are actually on a percentage basis relative to pre-COVID higher than any other part of the week. So discretionary times of day, when people have a choice about how to get around, but they have somewhere they want to go, whether it's to go to a park or to a nightlife or otherwise, they are coming back to transit. And that gives us a sense of optimism. Um, so I'll finish there, but, but saying that you know, the revival that we're undergoing post-COVID is very much evocative of, of, of Dick Ravitch's priorities, and uh, we hope we uh, honor his memory and how we're going about it. Well, thanks, thanks so much, Jano. Uh, and before I turn the turn the, the the mic over to Jeannie to ask to ask her questions, I have one reminder to the to the panel: uh, please turn your uh, turn your mics and your cameras back on uh, if you can, because we're going to go to Q and A. And so, one quick Q and A. Thank you also so much for the kind remarks about Dick. Um, so, you're counting very heavily on congestion. The first congestion pricing program in the United States kicking in next year. I see the. The, the tolling mechanisms are being are, are being put up, put in place. Uh, what's what's the risk this won't happen? Governor Murphy in New Jersey is is not happy about this. Uh, the Staten Island Borough President is not happy about this. Uh, what what happens? What happens if if uh, if this gets delayed, or you or you just think this is going to go ahead and go ahead and, and work as planned? Well, two two initial points. Uh, one is. Congestion pricing is the law of the state of New York. It was enacted in 2019. Sometimes if you talk to politicians in New Jersey, it's like, you know, Jano Lieber had a had, you know, had had too many drinks and came up with the idea. Um, but uh, you know, the, where we are is you know, I think some of the professionals on this call know, you know, have a fair amount of experience with environmental laws. Um, we completed this incredibly detailed environmental assessment. The Trump people sat on wouldn't really cooperate with us to actually do the environmental review between 2019 and when they left office. And but Biden administration came in and they started to cooperate with us. And the result was we did this incredibly robust environmental review under the federal environmental law, which is NEPA. And it looked at every possible impact. I think I, I extended into Leslie Richards' sphere of influence in analyzing intersections and traffic and air quality. Um, so we have a lot of confidence that um, that it's going to stay. But there, you know, the, the objections from New Jersey and some other folks are, are are basically criticisms of the Biden administration for how they conducted the environment. So I, I you know, in, in some, I have confidence that uh, you know, if federal environmental law and precedents apply, I think we're going to be fine. But I, I do want to sort of clarify a couple of things. One is. Uh, we're we're not doing this just to get money or uh, because we're against cars. The fundamental is New York's business district has ceased to function. You have ambulances can't get to hospitals and fire trucks can't get to fire. And God knows the Amazon vehicles that are central and all the delivery trucks that can't take transit can't get around. So we're wasting a lot of time and money and economic productivity. You have to do something. And in the era of climate change, you know, doing something also makes sense. So um, so this is a program that has been tried in so many other places, in London, obviously, in Stockholm, a million other places. And it's been successful. There's always controversy until it's implemented, and then people adapt to it, as they always do. I spent 14 years on the World Trade Center, so let me tell you, controversy does pass. Um, uh, so I, I think we're going to be fine. Clarification, that is 15, we're counting on congestion pricing as the, to fill $15 billion of our capital budget. It's not essential to that operating budget solution that I was describing before. 
the fiscal cliff is part of the capital budget. The MTA has a $55 billion five-year capital program, 15 billion of our current capital program. It's meant to be bonds that would be based on congestion pricing revenue. So the implications of this are real. It is It goes to our ability to maintain this 100-year-old system that wants to fall down. You know, you know, newsflash, if you apply enough water and, and chemicals from the surface into the underground area, there tends to be a, you know, an erosion of concrete and steel, and stuff tends to fall down. So we have to invest in physical structure. We have to invest in new signals so we can run trains safely and more frequently. We have to make the whole system ADA accessible. I have 472 stations, and after you know 40, 30 plus years of the ADA, we, 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 we still have 300 stations that we need to add true ADA accessibility to, and so on and so on and so on. So it's about state of good repair, it's about expanding new, the, the, the system, new areas, and it's about zero emission button. That's what this is going to pay for. It's not, you know, the New Jersey elected officials' rhetoric notwithstanding. It's not to fill some uh, hole in our uh, in our operating budget brought on by mismanagement and corruption, which is, I guess, their watchword. So uh, we're we're optimistic. Obviously, we're going to have more controversy, but we are, as you said, installing the infrastructure because we. As soon as we got that federal approval, we kicked into gear the physical installation of all of the sensors and the cameras and all the computer work. So we're on the move. Good point taken, Jeannie. Uh, all yours. Sure. Uh, so, so John was just talking about the capital issues in in, in our systems, and and lastly, there's some big changes uh, at in Pennsylvania with regard to your funding from the state. And I'm wondering also from Frank whether there have been some changing the changes in this regard. So Leslie, could you tell us what happened with the uh, Turnpike Authority money and so forth? Sure. So uh, we were thrilled. Uh, Jana mentioned about how borrowing is so important. Uh, here at SEPTA, we were unable to borrow on the money that came to us from the state because it came through our Turnpike Authority. And they borrowed uh, to get the money to give to us. And obviously, you can't borrow on money twice. And so it was really restricting us uh, in the amount of money that we could use toward our state of good repair backlog, which is over $5 billion. And uh, so just last year, it now comes to us through the vehicle sales tax, and we can use that uh, to, to issue debt, obviously. And so for the first time last year, SEPTA had a billion dollar uh, capital budget and uh, while we are very much underfunded, when you look at uh, our sister uh, agencies, and obviously New York, Jano, and, and New York are its own uh, measure. We don't we don't measure ourselves against the size of MTA. But when we look at Boston, when we look at Atlanta, Chicago, and others, um, you know we're 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 billions underneath where they are. So we're trying to catch up. Um, I also know I'll just jump ahead because I know um, you know timing is going to be difficult, but. We had discussed and prep for this, you know, about using capital funds for operating. For us, that's just we have such capital needs, and uh, you know, again, Jano mentioned this as well, separating operating from capital, and we don't want to get into that, um, you know, into that situation right now because our capital is needed for capital. Obviously, keeping also a hundred-year-old uh, system together. And then, lastly, I just want to mention because uh, Secretary Fox mentioned this when uh, we were asking about. You know why? Why do people not use transit here? And I would say our speakers today touched on it. We don't invest in transit like we see other countries investing in transit. So when transit is always the fastest, most reliable, best way to get places, and then you add on it about safety, and you add on the environmental uh, positive impacts, and you add on um, all the other benefits, um, you know, if we could go back in time, I think we would all wish that we had invested in different ways here so that it would be the top choice for a variety of reasons. Um, so we're all working toward that as well. Uh, Frank, I think Jeannie, uh, Jeannie asked the same question uh, of you as well as what about the capital needs of mass transit in California? How's the legislature dealing with that? Yeah, the capital needs are definitely there. I think last year in budget 
negotiations and discussions, this legislature set aside $4 billion to be allocated on a formula basis across the state for transit um, capital improvements. However, as operational funding shortfalls became apparent and agencies um, were requesting relief, and as the state was also facing a $32 billion budget deficit, I think it became difficult to find you know, new monies from the general fund to potentially provide as relief. And I think a way around that was, you know, taking money that had already been set aside, um, keeping it as previously agreed to in the previous budget and providing agencies the flexibility to use it for operations. However, that puts agencies in a difficult situation. Um, you know, in many cases, agencies, when they knew that money was going to be coming out and, you know, the budget year had already started to plan to use that funding on projects that, you know, do have federal dollars attached to them as well. So in some cases, agencies do have to keep that funding for capital to maintain their federal grants. So it is a difficult decision where agencies will need to decide with some of this money, you know, do we maintain it for the capital purposes and the projects that we have um, scoped out with, you know, federal and local funds contributed, or potentially delaying those projects and trying to fill the shortfalls that they face on the operations side. Let me ask a uh... A slightly different question. Uh, we're, we're coming up on the top of the hour and uh, and time, uh, so it's a jump ball question for everybody. Uh, what what kind of risks are there that that Congress um, may try to claw back some of the uh, some of the infrastructure money in I, I, in the infrastructure bill as well as in the Inflation Reduction Act? Uh, there's a lot of capital. There's a lot of capital money, capital project money here. Uh, we have a, a we have spending hawks in certainly in the house uh what are you all counting on uh on, on getting from washington over the next few years and, and what are the risks and i'll who wants, who wants to take that first uh, leslie you're, you're I, I see you smiling I so can, why don't i can't well yeah. look i can jump in we just got our largest grant ever uh through a raise grant um and uh we've combined that with others that we've gotten through the bill which is wonderful um, so we've gotten a, a little over a hundred million dollars uh, so far, putting that to good use, um, making our system ADA accessible. We have the same issues that have been mentioned earlier about making an old system uh, accessible. But for us, it's uh, rail car procurements. That's good, what's going to be huge. We are hoping to get several uh, hundred million dollars uh, in help for that. Uh, if I could go back in time here, except I wish we had gone forward with rail car procurements. We have one of the oldest uh, rail car fleets in the country, if not the oldest, and we need it across the board. We need it for our regional rail. We need it for our subways. We need it for our trolleys, for everything. And so we're really hoping to do that. So I'm hoping to at least double, if not triple, what we've gotten so far. And Jenna, what's what what's the what's the federal role in your uh, in in your capital plan? You 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 talked about you talked about uh, congestion pricing in capital. What, what about uh, federal grants? Well, our the the feds represent about ten billion of our uh, fifty five billion dollar capital program, um, and um, obviously it's great to have Chuck Schumer as the majority leader. Um, and he sticks up for New York, although you know his his and President Biden, Biden's uh, favorite project is not an MTA project; it's the Gateway project. You know that is connecting and re rebuilding the tunnels between New York and New Jersey, which is principally the benefit of Amtrak and New Jersey Transit. Um, but uh, but we are dependent on that ten billion dollars. Chuck Schumer always, you know, is obviously sticking up for us as as our the rest of our delegation is as well. We have a couple of big projects that are, you know, that the good news for us is there's a couple of big projects that have been in the queue and gone through all the bureaucratics for some time. So I have reasonable level of optimism uh, that those are going to, you know, are going to make it through and will be funded even in a range of, of congressional scenarios. Um, but I, you know, I, I think your point is well taken, which is broadly speaking in the transit industry. You know, the, the IIJA was a huge shot in the arm for capital, which is, you know, we're, we're all struggling with the operating side and the feds are a big piece of the other side. And if we're serious about climate change action, not to have, uh, a, you know, uh, make this moment about investing in alternatives to the internal combustion engine and, uh, 
and 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 greenhouse gases is a real is is just piling risk upon risk. So um, we agree with you. I think the implication that that we really need Congress to stick up for that IIJA shot in the arm of funding for transit capital. And on that note, thank you very much, Jan. On, on on that note, um, we're at the top of the hour, and that is it for another special briefing. Um, Contact slides uh, are going up on the screen. If you want to contact the panelists and our team, uh, the info will be up on your screen momentarily. Uh, please go ahead and, and, and follow up. Thanks so much, Jeannie, and to all of our panelists and our wonderful audience for joining us. Special briefing will be taking a break in August. Even we get a vacation, but we'll be back in September and we'll be taking up mass transit and infrastructure for sure. So watch your email, our websites, your social media, and your favorite podcast platform for info on the next episode. Thanks also so much to the Volcker Alliance, members of the Penn IUR Board of Advisors and the Century Foundation, and special thanks to our production team, Graham Dowd, Nolan Ritzenberg, Idellis Foster, Steve Klieg, Arden Jordan, Diana Lind, and Amy Montgomery. Thanks again to Jeannie. And for now, I'm Bill Glasgow, and we'll see you in September. <laughs>